Okay. Great. Can we can, can I see your pictures? Can I see your photos just uh, briefly to know that I'm talking to human beings? <laughs> can somebody say hi? With, with your share your share your video. Can you hear me? Colleagues, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Thank you. yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, at least I have some one person, so that's enough. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, we'll be starting from where we stopped uh, last week. Uh, uh, but, uh, I think we are about starting with uh, the visual organization. So we will start from there uh, to round up with organizational structure. Mm -hmm. All right. The file is still booting, so at the moment from now we'll start. All right. So, Colleen, this was where we stopped last week. Uh, that is uh, the visual organization in terms of uh, new designs, new design option. Uh, I think we have discussed uh, the team structure. Uh, this is now the visual organization structure. And when we talk about visual organization as, uh, structure, we are just referring to a small core organization that outsource its major business functions. Can you see? A core or a small core organization that outsource its major business functions. So uh, because it is a small organization that focuses on their core business, the management style of that organization is very much centralized with little or no departmentalization. Can you see? No departmentalization because they outsource to different part of the world. They outsource to other organizations within the country. And of course, uh, you have uh, you must have read the article I sent to you on outsourcing. So that is what visual organization is talking about. Uh, the merit of a visual organization is that it provides maximum flexibility. It provides maximum flexibility while concentrating on what the organization does best. That is actually the aim of outsourcing. That is that organization should focus on their core competency. Can you see? On their core business, on their main business, and outsource what you call the periphery businesses or the small activities that is not core can you see for instance uh, uh, the accounting uh, 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 activities of the organization can be outsourced to other accounting firms for instance uh, a very good example was a swiss airline that outsourced most of its accounting activities to india uh, uh, and uh, some other asian countries can you see 
that is a good example of a visual organization where the organization is a, a particular play by walking through network of outsource organization, organization that operate within the outsourcing environment. You see? So the disadvantage of a visual organization is that it reduces control over key parts of the business. You see, because activities of the organizations have been outsourced to others, certainly the organization cannot be in full control of key parts of the business of the organization. And there are dangers to that. Some of the dangers is that most of the outsourcing companies can become major competitors to the organization outsourcing after they have masterminded most of the activities they normally produce for the main organization. And you see, that, that can lead to competition, uh, uh, which can actually uh, uh, adversely affect the organization outsourcing. Another disadvantage is that, of course, if you are outsourcing, you are not there to monitor the quality or the standard of the product that you are expecting. So that can lead to low quality product, of course, coming to you. But of course, there is always agreement that the, 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 the quality of the uh, uh, finished product uh, should be of high standard. Okay, you see? But certainly also there are instances where uh, some outsourcing like companies can become funny, can you see? So that is uh, with regards to visual organization. All right, we'll move to the next slide. If you look at a good example of visual organization, you can see now the middle here is executive group. That is the main activity that the organization is now doing. Uh, the organization is undertaking the main, the, the, the executive group. That because now the core activity of the organization and other peripheral activities are, are outsourced to other people. They can be advertising agencies in South Africa, if it is a South African organization. For instance, if you look at some of the core centers uh, in South Africa, you see that most of those core centers are not actually the owner of the course they are making. Sometimes somebody will call you and say, I'm for multi-choice. I ask, where are you actually calling? And maybe she wants to sell a product. She will say she's for multi-choice. When you prove for that, you see that she's just an agent, a call center, calling from a call center. Now, if you tell her, OK, give me your company's number, I will come down. I say, no, uh, she's not uh, in that particular company. So these are outsource uh, activities, can you see? So for instance, an advertising agency can be outsourced. Most of the activities related to advertising, instead of the organization having an advertising unit within their organization, having permanent staffs that are managing the uh, advertising unit, they decide to outsource because they cannot continue to increase their overhead, the overhead uh, uh, in terms of number of staff and, of course, managers that will be managing the advertising uh, uh, department. Can you see? Then, of course, you can see the diagram here, there also. Independent research and development consulting firm or firm. You know, independent research and development consulting firm. Can you see? These are research and development consulting firm. So instead of the organization having their own research and development uh, 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 department, they outsource to outside companies that can actually do the same job for them. And through that process, they reduce the cost, the overhead cost of production. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fantastic. All right. Then, of course, you can see another one down there, factory in South Korea. That is to say that the outsourcing is not just an activity that is concentrated within border. As a result of globalization, and of course, the incursion of technology, people can now outsource to other organizations across the globe. Can you see? 
And I gave the instance of Swiss Air, which is of course Switzerland Air, outsourcing their finance activities to India. Can you see it? Or outsourcing some of their uh, 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 salary related matters to Indian companies that are uh, uh, very good in finance related matters. Can you see? Or their payroll, as the case may be. Can you see? So you can see factories in South Korea, factories in China, factories in Bangladesh. You can remember the other time uh, there was a fire outbreak in one of the factories in Bangladesh where they make tester, you know, Nike product and all the rest. You may think they are made in America. Most of them are made even in South Africa here. And when they finish producing it, they send all the book to America and it is written made in America. Whereas it is produced by our, our, our women in Eastern Cape. It is sold by some of our uh, uh, workers here in Africa or in other third world countries like Bangladesh, like uh, Thailand, like of course uh, 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 Vietnam and the US. Can you see? So factories in South Korea is an example of of course uh, 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 international outsourcing. Can you see? Whereby we don't outsource only to uh, organization within our country, but we can outsource to organization within the global uh, environment, can you see, or uh, outside our national border. All right, so the next one is commission sales representative, can you see? Sometimes also their sales activities, it is outsourced to people who take commission commission they are not parts and parcel of the organization but they are paid according to sales so they take commission they are not members of the organization so in that case we may not be having a sales department in our organization you see instead of having the sales department where we have permanent staff and paying them all the time uh definitely we at source can you see and if you look at my the article, uh, 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 one of the articles I sent to you, written by myself and Professor Bayat, you can see where I spoke about outsourcing and division of labor, mutually exclusive concept, where I try to compare uh, division of labor and outsourcing to actually infer that both of them actually lead to labor exploitation. And you see, because the more we outsource all these activities to low-wage countries, definitely our workers suffer. Can you see? Our workers suffer. I give you an instance of what led to the uh, 2008 global economic crisis. It was as, as a result of default in subprime mortgage. More the activities in most of the corporations in America were outsourced to China, Thailand, Vietnam, and all the rest. As a result, workers in America who took mortgage for their houses started defaulting. Can you see? They started defaulting to smaller bank, and the smaller bank started defaulting to bigger bank. That was one led to the uh, subprime mortgage crisis, which resulted in the 2008 global economic meltdown. Can you see? So it has its own merit. It has also some of the uh, demerits or disadvantages of actually utilizing this kind of uh, operation. And in fact, in one of my, in my PhD thesis, I also argued in a particular place that if we continue to rely on visual organization, definitely we will, negati we will negatively impact on industrial democracy because there's no worker to dialogue with. There's no worker to contribute in decision making that affects them. There is no unionism. Certainly union will go down because union is based on membership. So if we outsource all our activities, definitely the number of unions will be weakened. In fact, that is why across the globe, the unions are getting weaker and weaker every day. Because union depends on members and contribution of members to survive. Can you see? If you notice the militancy of unionism in South Africa back in, say, from 1994 up to 2007, you can see that their militancy was very strong. 
But systematically, unions are beginning to get weaker even in South Africa. Did you notice that? Can I hear something? Yes, yes. yes. They are beginning to lose their strength. Can you see? Because of most of this new employment or flexibilization within the employment uh, environment. Can you see? Because of this flexibilization of employment relationship. Can you see? Or flexible employment relationship. Can you see? Unions are beginning to lose their grounds, and they know that. Because if we have, if we still have militant union in South Africa, I don't think most of the organizations that are now relying on visual or on uh, 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 new uh, uh, technologies that are destroying jobs will just get uh, their way easily. And see, but now they are introducing all forms of working mechanism, working process that affects workers adversely, and there's no union protesting. Can you see? But before, before you introduce technology, before you retrench workers, certainly there are st certain stages that uh, uh, will involve the union, and there will be a very strong debate. But gradually, gradually, now you can see that the union is beginning to lose their strength. Why? Because, for instance, now let's take, for instance, Standard Bank, where most workers might have been retrenched. As a result, as uh, as a result of introduction of so so many apps that now require uh, uh, customers or clients to operate through their apps, certainly that will reduce the number of unions in that particular bank because most of the people retrenched will never be members of union. Can you see? So these are some of the negative uh, aspect of uh, visual organization. Is that clear? Yes, sir. It's clear, Professor. But what is the how does how does that then draw into organizational leadership in terms of the the module that we're doing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, uh, that 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 now goes to talk to ethics. Can you see? That goes to talk to ethics. If we are introducing new forms of work arrangement, which is actually adversely affecting employees or affecting other systems within the workplace, I think as leaders, we must rationalize. We must actually try to weigh the balance. Can you see? We must try to ask ourselves, what is the social aspect of most of these new innovations that we are adopting or new employment patterns that we are adopting how is it affecting the human beings can you see so as a leader those are the things we must start considering uh, because if you look at uh, 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 the, when globalization started most of the organization where people are retrenched are uh, were patronized by shareholders can you see and in some instances Managers retrench employee not because the organization is not making work or the organization is not making profit, but they just want their share to rise up. Can you see? Or they just want uh, to reduce costs, even when they are making profit. Can you see? So, in other words, employees support managers to make profit. Now, when the profit is, is made, automation is introduced through this profit that is made by workers and workers are retrenched, can you see? So we have to actually look at also the moral aspect of this. So as leaders, we should be able to ask ourselves, is it all about profit, can you see? We'll come to that when we, when we touch on the ethic side of uh, your course. So all these things also talks to leadership, can you see? Introduction of most of these new dynamics, within the workplace or new employment patterns within the workplace. Most of these decisions are taken, are taken by leaders. Can you see? Not employees, not uh, ordinary people within the workplace. So leaders must also be morally accountable. Can you see? 
and of course socially accountable, you know, and of course uh, uh, leaders must also know the res social responsibility of business to communities, to workers, to nations, and of course to the environment. Can you see? So that is where the leadership comes there. Can you see? There's always leadership implication in most of the things we are touching here. Is that clear? Understood. Yeah, okay, fantastic. So that is why we touch on this. Uh, because uh, uh, issues related to structures, decision around structures are also decisions of leadership. Can you see? So that is why it is part of the uh, uh, part of the discussion. And if you look at your syllabus in the first uh, unit, you will see that organizational structure is part of it. Organizational structure and, of course, organizational culture. And culture is also led by leaders within organization. Is that clear? All right. Are we together? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Yes. All right. Okay, we progress. Now we we'll come to another new design option for organization, which is, of course, what is referred to as boundaryless organization. This is also a new form of organization structure, uh, which is an organization that seeks to eliminate the chain of command. You remember what we mean by chain of command? Who reports to who? Can you see? And it have limitless span of control. Can you see limitless? Limitless. The, the span of control is not restricted. And of course, replace departments with empowered teams. Can you see? It replace different departments with empowered teams. That is what is known as a boundaryless organization, where interaction can take place from one team to the other, and from the other team to the other. Can you see? In, in spite of whatever each of the teams may be doing within an organization. Can you see? So it's a kind of team form concept, you know, and uh, which of course eliminate vertical, which is hierarchical, and of course horizontal departmentalization. And I think I was reading uh, 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 one of the uh, uh, South African uh, Institute of uh, uh, People Management magazine, where it speaks about breaking down the organizational silos. Can you see? Organizational silo, that is S I L O. He said, break down the silos. In other words, we should break down the hierarchies. Can you see? Cut the middleman. And of course, we should also break down the horizontal differentiation between departments, where this department try to claim that the, part, this, the other department is the problem, and this department claiming that this other department is the problem. So there should be harmony, there should be a kind of a collaboration between departments within organization. So it emphasizes elimination of vertical, which is hierarchical, and of course, horizontal, which is departmental, internal boundaries of sil or silos, can you see? Break down external, it also break down borderless organization, also break down external barriers to customers and suppliers. Can you see? So there's no barrier in terms of also relationship between different teams with customers and of course suppliers within the organization. That is boundaryless organization. An organization that is flexible, free to interact, free to collaborate within the different teams within that particular organization. That is what is known as borderless organization. Both internal collaboration and, of course, external organization is permitted within the borderless organization. Is that clear? Yes. That clear? Fantastic. Yes, what All would right. be an example of a boundaryless organization? Is that what? What would be an example of a boundaryless organization? Okay, an example of uh, a borderless organization could be, uh, uh, for instance, uh, 
maybe some of your some of your current uh, retail uh, retail athletes, you know, uh, could 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 have a kind of example of that, you know, of a borderless organization where different units within the organization can, of course, collaborate without uh, much uh, departmentalization, you know. So uh, uh, there, could, there cannot be, since it's, a, it's a, actually a new uh, form of uh, organization structure, uh, basically, I, I think what comes to my mind is, for instance, a retail athlete, you know, uh, where different departments within the organization can function uh, without, uh, of course, uh, hindrance. And uh, also, uh, currently also, in some of the uh, big uh, uh, business organizations, uh, in some of the big business organizations, there is also now this tendency uh, for different departments to function uh, collaboratively without creating that uh, organizational silo. Uh, you see, uh, uh, even to a certain extent, some, some public uh, uh, organizations are also taking into consideration such kind of uh, organizational structure. Okay, see? So it's a new organizational structure. And uh, uh, basically, based on this explanation now, you can also look at for organizations that uh, are, are not restrictive in terms of their hierarchical structure and, of course, uh, uh, departmentalization within that particular organization. And of course, how each of the teams relate also to their customers and of course to their suppliers without hindrance. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's more or less a flexible organizational structure. All right, we'll progress. Uh, the next aspect there is uh, now in terms of trying to actually show uh, two different kind of organizational structure that fit into this uh, different structure that we are talking about. We'll talk about two models. The two models, one is of course the mechanistic model and the other one of course is uh, uh, what we refer to as the organic uh, model. Now when we talk about the mechanistic model, what is it trying to talk about? The mechanistic model is a structure that is characterized by extensive dep departmentalization, high formalization, a limited information network, and centralization. And when you look at the mechanistic model, it seems very, very much closely related to bureaucracy or the hierarchical structure type of organization. Can you see where uh, uh, you can see now different four departments there? Can you see high department uh, uh, departmentalization, uh, 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 character by extensive departmentalization. There can be more than six departments, both big and small department or medium department, and of course limited information network. Can you see there is no network? There is no information network. Uh, 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 the, the information is a little bit uh, restricted. Uh, you see, limited information network, and of course, uh, centralization. Uh, you see, centralization is whereby decision making is taken at the head of each of the department within uh, this particular uh, uh, diagram. Uh, you see, without uh, decentralizing the uh, decision making, without giving other people's opportunity or other individuals opportunity to make decision within the organization. So when the decision one decision is centralized, it resides with the top person within that organization. And without giving a kind of uh, 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 yes or no to a particular decision, the decision cannot hold. Can you see? Now we move to the next uh, one there, which is of course uh, uh, organic model. In terms of uh, the organic model, uh, it's a structure that is flat. Can you see? The structure is flat. Can you see? There's no hierarchical uh, structure within the organization. And it uses cross hierarchical, cross 
hierarchical and cross-functional team. Can you see? It uses cross-hierarchical and cross-functional team. I'll come to explain that. And has low formalization, low formalization, low formality, possesses a comprehensive information network. So information is allowed to flow. Can you see? Comprehensive information network and relies on participative decision making. Can you see? So decision is not concentrated in the hand of one person. People brainstorm and come together to take decision. Can you see? So that is an organic model. So let's just look at the diagram in order to uh, give our perspective on it uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the two mechanistic versus organic structure. If you look at the mechanistic model there, you will see that the mechanistic model uh, seems to have uh, hierarchies. Can you see? You can see the top man there on top. And of course, certainly, of, of course, there is also uh, uh, four departments uh, following there. Uh, and of course, each of the departments may also have uh, their own leaders, or of course, their managers. Then uh, you can see other the people there uh, uh, in, in different departments as the last uh, uh, individual. And of course, the hierarchy can, of course, increase again, can you see, as the organization expands, if they want to demarcate most of the functions, which, you know, of course, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, four uh, different uh, 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 departments, can you see. So in terms of mechanistic uh, model, you can still see there is high specialization. People must be specialists to belong to a department. Rigid departmentalization. Departmentalization is rigid. Can you see? It's not flexible. And of course, clear line of clear chain of command. Yes, everybody must know who they are reporting to or who reports to who. Narrow span of control. You already know what we meant by narrow and of course lifespan of control and i have given you that diagram during our last class centralization power is concentrated at the top can you see centralization and of course high formalization that is actually the characteristics of mechanistic model and when we talk about the organic model you can see that the organic model is flexible if you look at the diagrams that you have there, you can see the first one is a, a, a kind of a triangular shape. And of course, the second one is like a, a kind of angle shape. And the other one is just like a diagonal shape. And the other one is like a triangular shape. It tells you about the different teams within the organization. Can you see the different team within the organization doing different things within that particular organization? That is the symbol. And in spite of the fact that they are functioning differently or they have different assignments or duty to perform within organization, there is opportunity for collaboration. You can see the cross there or the X there. Can you see? They can the, 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 the angle uh, at the at the top can collaborate with uh, the angle below. I see the triangle at the top can collaborate with the triangle below. It can also collaborate with the red rectangle. Right can you see the line there also? So it's a cross functional. Can you see both cross cross functional and of course uh, 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 cross hierarchical team? Can you see? So you can collaborate. Uh, uh, S from the S uh, point, as well as you can also collaborate uh, uh, side by side. Can you see? So there's high level of flexibility. Functional teams, cross hierarchical team, free flow of information, wide span of control, decentralization, and of course, uh, low formalization. Can you see? So the organic structure has, of course, uh, included both the characteristics of a flat organization as well as the characteristics of uh, a team organization. And you see, that is why it is organic uh, structure, where flexibility is allowed. Is that clear? Sir? Yeah. 
Yes, um, sorry to cut you. I just wanted to know if you could make an example of like um, both models in like uh, uh, um, within like a business practice. Okay. Uh, well, uh, probably the le the next slide uh, will share will share some light to that, uh, okay. and I will also touch our original slide that I shared earlier to also give you uh, a clearer picture of what I'm trying to explain here. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Is that great? Okay. All right. Now, uh, why do structure differ? We're going to talk about uh, strategy. Can you see? Strategy uh, in terms of uh, structure. A strategy that emphasizes uh, strategies are of different caliber. The first one is, uh, is uh, innovative strategy, which is a strategy that emphasizes the introduction of major new products and services. And of course, we have cost minimization strategy. A cost minimization strategy is a strategy that emphasizes tight cost control. Can you see? Tight cost control, uh, avoidance of unnecessary innovation and marketing expensive, and of course, uh, price cutting. Then we have imitation strategy. Can you see? A strategy, uh, imitation strategy is a strategy that seeks to move into new products and new market after their viability has already been proven. Can you see? That is to say, you go into the market, if you have seen others who have ventured into that area and still making profit. Why innovation, a strategy that emphasizes the introduction of major new products and of course services. So you are the leader, you, you want to initiate uh, that particular uh, uh, new product and services. So let's see how uh, each one of them pending into mechanistic and of course, uh, organic uh, structure. Now, with regards to innovation, innovation because we are looking for something new, because we are venturing into new market, can you see, because we are exploring, certainly the structure have to be flexible, which is of course uh, organic uh, structure, if we are adopting innov innovative strategy, can you see? then definitely uh, our structure have to be a kind of uh, 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 organic structure. And a good example of uh, innovative organization could be our, com uh, our current IT environment. Can you see? IT organization. I'm not touching uh, at uh, what uh, uh, the question you asked, you know, uh, e innovation. You can see that the IT environment, the technological environment, Organization within the technological environment are ever changing. Can you see? Because there are competitors. In fact, when you are trying to settle down that you have actually discovered or you have actually produced something, certainly another organization has come up with another thing. Can you see? So under such circumstances, you may want to adopt an organic structure. Can you see? Which is of course a loose structure uh, that require low specialization low formalization, and of course, decentralization of a decision, can you see? Now, when we talk about cost min minimization, cost minimization uh, uh, will be much more better for a mechanistic uh, uh, structure, can you see? If, you, if your strategy as an organization is interested in minimizing the cost of production, certainly mechanistic structure will be your type of organization, which require tight control, extensive work specialization, high formalization, high and of course, high concentration. And a good example of organization that we for fit in with a mechanistic structure is a building, building uh, organization, or of course, an uh, 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 organization that is into uh, uh, building, and of course, a uh, construction, construction uh, organization. Can you see? Where you see how you can actually minimize the cost of uh, production. Can you see? Are you with me? Sir, I wanted to ask a question. Yeah. 
With the mechanistic model, with it being so structured, how does it minimize cost? Because with a narrow scope of control, doesn't that mean that there's more managers and that therefore raising costs? Uh, no, that, that, that is actually uh, uh, a, a way of looking at it. But the bottom line of the matter is that the rationale of creating excessive control, tight control, and of course, extensive work specialization is because you want to actually curtail costs. Because if it is an, an organic uh, uh, organization, they encourage experimentation. And of course, experimentation can come out right or wrong. Can you see? And if it goes wrong, it's automatic wastage. Are you with me? Okay, I understand. So it's ma mainly going in cost minimization through um, like reducing error in the business within respect. Yeah, reducing error. So it's tight control. When resources is tightly controlled before, before you make use of resources, you must explain that these resources we need is not. Can you see? But okay. in terms of innovation, we are venturing. We don't know whether it will succeed or not. Some organizations encourage innovation. Whether it brings positive things or negative things, they even encourage people, uh, if you try, uh, at least you have made an effort, even if you did not uh, get it right. You know That is an innovative organization. But an organization that want to minimize the cost of production would like to use a kind of tight control, and they would like to use extensive work specialization. That is to say that you must not do what you don't know. <laughs> you see? So, <laughs> so they choose the right person so that there will not be mistake. Can you see? And okay. of course, how formalization. Can you see? Everything is done according to specification. Can you see? Everything is done in a formal manner. Can you see? There is no way of experimenting. There is no way of trying, thinking out of the boss. You must restrict yourself to the boss. Can you see? And of course, and of course, high centralization. Before the decision to, to, to utilize resources is made, definitely the boss have to authorize it. Can you see? So, so that is uh, uh, in terms of cost minimization. There are apart from apart from the construction uh, companies, there are so many organizations that also use mechanic mechanistic structure. But construction company is a very good example. Sorry, sir, can I just quickly ask? Uh, so we can either have a, an organic or a mechanistic, we will never have a hybrid organization or, or? Hybrid organization? Like where it's a mixture of both. So it, is it only that is the last one. That is, Yeah, that is the last one now. That Okay, let's agree it's hybrid. That is imitation strategy, can you see? If you are using a kind of imitation strategy, which is, of course, a combination of mechanistic and organic structure, can you see? Means of loose with tight structure, tight control over current activity, and looser control for new undertakings. And uh, according to Professor De Thomas, she gave example of uh, the fashion industry. Uh, for instance, uh, Woolworth, and of course, uh, Fosheni and the rest, can you see? So she gave an example of that. Why they are a kind of trying to manage their cost or trying to continue doing what they are doing, they look for other new opportunities. Can you see? Innovative opportunities that can bring more result to their organization or that can bring more earning or profit to their organization. So a combination, a hybrid structure, in fact, thank you for using that term also. I think it's also referred to as hybrid culture. I think I have I've seen that in other textbook also. Hybrid, yeah. Mixture of mechanistic and organic structure. Is that clear? That's clear, sir. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Okay. Now the question is, why do structures differ? We are still talking about, we will be talking about size. Can you see? Size. How the size of an organization affect its structure? Its structure. As an organization grow larger, 
it become more mechanistic. Can you see? As organization grow larger, it become more mechanistic. And of course, I have given you a perspective. That is why I told you that the mechanic, uh, the mechanistic structure, looks very much like the hierarchical structure. And when I was giving, uh, when I was uh, uh, lecturing you last uh, uh, during our last meeting, I gave you the difference between a flat structure and a hierarchical structure. That at the beginning of an organization, there's tendency to have a flat structure because it is owner and of course uh, uh, other employees uh, within the organization who hires other employees and all decisions comes on him to other employees, so they have the class structure. But as organization moves uh, uh, from one stage of life cycle to the other, then definitely the organization uh, uh, will begin to recruit more people. There will be a need to start departmentalization. And of course, this will warrant uh, uh, the organization to become more hierarchical. And of course, that is why I told you that hierarchical structure or bureaucratic organization seems almost uh, 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 similar and related to mechanistic uh, structure. So large organization is characterized by more specialization, more vertical levels, more specialization. Specialization brings about departmentalization. And of course, more rules and regulation. Rules and regulation has to do more with bureaucracy. Can you see? Bureaucracy is governed by rules and regulation. Can you see? So uh, uh, definitely a bigger organization will definitely utilize a, a mechanistic structure. Why organization that is actually uh, a, a smaller organization will like to use, uh, of course, either uh, uh, the, the flat structure uh, and of course, uh, uh, the dynamic uh, uh, structure. Can you see? Then, uh, uh, in terms of size, that is why organization structure differs. And of course, we also have uh, uh, technology, technology issue with regards to organizational structure. How an organization transfer its input into output? Can you see? Different organizations, both production and, of course, service organizations, have ways of transferring their input into output. Can you see? And you see different organizations have different input and output. What is an input in one organization may become an output in another organization. Or what is an output in one organization may become an input in another organization. So the technology of an organization will certainly determine the structure of an organization. So for instance, if the activities within an organization is characterized, uh, 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 the activities within an organization is characterized by routineness, uh, which is standardized or customized in activities. So uh, if the activities uh, within an organization, routine at, uh, technologies are associated with top departmentalization if the technology of production or the technology of providing services to uh, 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 your customers is required in routine activities, is associated with top departmentalized structure and of course formalization within the organization. Can you see? However, if the activities within the organization are not routine, uh, that is, it is not standardized, uh, definitely uh, that is associated with more delegated decision making, uh, it, uh, more delegated decision making uh, authorities, where people can be given opportunity to take decision on behalf of their leaders. And you see, so routine, what you do every day, if it is so, it is the same standard, the same procedure, the same way of doing things every day, uh, a lay down rule. Uh, is, is how you uh, transfer your input into output, definitely it will require a tall departmental, uh, required with a tall departmentalized structure and formalization in the organization. But if it is non-routine, 
technology in terms of how you deliver your good to your final consumers or to your customers, definitely it will uh, uh, require or it will be associated with delegation of uh, authorities. And of course, uh, there is another uh, third point there in the middle, which is routine technology leads to centralization when there is a low formalization. That is to say, routine technology, if uh, the technology, uh, routine technology lead to centralization when formalization is low. You know. I've actually tried to uh, look at that uh, concept uh, from the textbook to, to, to make a proper rational uh, 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 explanation around that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, the concept is a little because when you talk about routine, routine also will lead to centralization. But I think what they are trying to infer here is that, of course, the, uh, uh, the formalization may be there, should be there, but it should be minimal. Can you see? Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, if you are using routine technology. All right. Then uh, we move, and of course, why do organizations organization structure? Why do structure differ? Another aspect is environment. Can you see the environmental factors or the environment of an organization affect their structure? Can you see institution or forces outside the organization potentially affect the organization performance? Can you see? institutions or forces and i have given you different forces around the environment uh, within the environment can you see we are spoken about it when we started this uh, lecture the forces outside the environment government people within a particular community or within a particular country uh environmental fun uh, other uh, biological factors i give the instance of the covid 19 government policies inflation those are economic issues. All these things that affect the organization of which the organization have no control over. Can you see? So uh, key dimensions in terms of the environmental factor is capacity. Uh, uh, the first is capacity, the degree to which an environment can support growth, the degree to which an environment can support growth. Then the next one is volatility which is of course the degree of instability in the environment and of course the uh, third one there is complexity which is of course the degree of heterogeneity and concentration among environmental elements so let's just uh, have a look in terms of how the best structure to utilize within this uh, uh, different uh, dimensions uh, the three dimension model, model you can see now complexity, scarcity, and of course dynamic. And of course, we have uh, at, the, uh, at the tip of the arrows complexity, scarcity, and of course uh, dynamics. Then, of course, at the head, we have the opposite of dynamic is stable. And of course, the opposite of scarcity is abundance. And of course, the opposite of uh, simple is complex. So the point of the matter is when the environment is complex, when there is scarcity within the environment, when the environment is dynamic and ever changing, it is much more appropriate to use the organic structure. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes. yes. Yeah, when, the, when, when the organization is operating within a complex environment, when there's scarcity within that environment, when the environment is dynamic, that is ever changing, it is more appropriate to use the organic uh, structure. However, when the environment is stable, when there's abundance within that um, environment, when uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, complexity within the environment is simple, uh, it is, of course, uh, much more appropriate to use the mechanistic uh, structure. Is that clear?
Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Great. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks a lot. All right. Now, bureaucracy. Uh, there are people who argue that bureaucracy is dead. Is bureaucracy dead? I just want to hear your perspectives. No. No, it's definitely no. not. It Why is it not dead? Oh. Why is it not dead from your perspective? I just want to hear someone. Why is bureaucracy not dead? Why do you say it is not dead? Because some companies and some industries, no matter what what we do, they'll still need like high levels of specialization and formalization, and that's why it won't die. Okay. And I think again, it's because, uh, like you said, um, if the organizations are um, hierarchical or mechanic. Obviously, bureaucracy just exists automatically because of the, the regulations and the rules that are put in. So, okay. yeah. great. Now, I, 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 I like your opinion. And of course, uh, if you look at, for instance, our university structure, you can see that bureaucracy also at times uh, reflects itself. You know, we still have uh, specializations. Can you see? We still have formalities in terms of how we do things. We still have different departments within our institution. We will still have centralization. Of course, the decision making comes from, of course, uh, 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 the top man in the organization. Definitely, uh, that decision has to be agreed at the Senate uh, before it is actually finally taken as a decision. But of course, the vice chancellor still have a very strong influence uh, uh, in terms of decision making. And of course, a narrow span of control. We still see a lot of hierarchical span of control, can you see, uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, decision making. And of course, adherence to chain of command, can you see? You report a particular person, we always talk about who is your, uh, uh, who, who is your uh, uh, supervisor, or who is your direct report, we we'll use the term direct report, you know. So that is to show that bureaucracy is still very, very much uh, endemic, and of course, uh, 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 per pervasive in our current society. And of course, in most of the public sectors, organization or public service organization, the uh, bureaucracy is still very, very much uh, noticeable uh, within those environments. For instance, uh, 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 because of the fact that uh, public service organization need to treat everybody equally, they need to deliver the same kind of product to everybody. They need to, of course, uh, 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 follow the same pattern in terms of most of the activities they do. Then that simply means that they still have to follow all the principles of uh, bureaucracy. In that case, bureaucracy still remains in the 21st century. Can you see? So characteristics of bureaucracy, like I have mentioned to you, includes specialization, formalization, departmentalization, centralization, narrow span of control, adherence to chain of command. And of course, the question is, why is it that bureaucracy survives? Can you see? Why is it that bureaucracy survives? The first one is large size to prevail. We still have large size organization. And as a result of that, definitely bureaucracy will still continue uh, to prevail. And of course, environmental turbulence can be largely managed. Can you see? Environmental turbulence can be largely uh, managed. Okay, this is the perspective of uh, 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 this uh, uh, textbook, you know. Uh, but we have also, uh, uh, there's also a way we can argue it that, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, and, uh, that, of course, uh, the uh, other structures. Uh, will fit in the such like uh, uh, the dynamic structure will fit in more in that particular uh, uh, in a turbulent environment, just like we have argued initially. But of course, because of strict control, also uh, definitely turbulence can likely be managed uh, within bureaucracy. Then, of course, standardization achieved through hiring people who have undergone extensive educational training. Can you see? 
bureaucracy survive because standardization is achieved through the hiring of people who have undergone extensive, extensive educational training. And of course, uh, technology, uh, technology maintains control. And you see, technology maintains control because bureaucracy is all about control. And we can also use technology to control people, can you see, at work. So this is why bureaucracy survive even in our 21st century world of work. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Fantastic. All right. We'll progress. Now, organizational design and employee behavior. How do employees react to different organizational structure? Can you see? Research findings have shown that work specialization contributes to higher employee productivity. Can you see? Specialization contributes to higher employee productivity. In, in fact, take your mind to division of labor that I spoke about when we started our discussion. I'm going to, of course, read that article on division of labor that I have also attached to you. Can you see? But it reduces job satisfaction. Can you see, of employees. Because when you continue to do routine job or when you continue to do repetitive work or every day, all the time, a time comes when you become fatigued. The job becomes fatigious. And of course, you become bored of doing the same thing. Can you see? And that can even make you feel that you are not challenged. You are no more using your own initiative. And of course, in terms of also this repetitive job, what Taylor or Frederick Taylor used in experimenting issues of, uh, of course, uh, uh, specialization was by, in fact, uh, employing a lunatic to experiment how the lunatic would enjoy the same job he is doing all the time. So for the fact that the fellow was a lunatic, he, he doesn't complain, can you see? But when a rational man is doing one particular job all the time, a time comes when you get tired of doing that same thing all the time. You wake up at times in the morning, you are dazed because you are going back to the same thing you do every day. It leads to boredom. It leads to fatigue. It leads to, it, it mars your initiative. Can you see? So that is why to certain extent, it reduces uh, job satisfaction of employees. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Yes. All right. So the next one there is the benefit of special. Yeah, the benefit of specialization have increased rapidly as employees seek more intrinsic, intrinsically rewarding jobs. Can you see? The benefit of specialization have decreased because employees. According to Oldman, Oldman and uh, uh, Hedden, they argued that employees now like varieties in the job they do. Can you see? And of course, they like a job that they are doing from their mind, not just the extrinsic reward of a job, but the intrinsic reward of a job. Intrinsic reward is something that gives you joy from the inside. Can you see? And that is what motivates you because you enjoy doing what you're doing. Rather than the extrinsic aspect, which is of course the money or monetary aspect, employees now like to do what they enjoy doing. So if, you're, if uh, you are specialized in one particular thing, definitely you may be confined to that particular thing. So the job is not the motivator, can you see? The, bo the job is not the motivator because, of course, you are rewarded according to the number of production, according to the number of productivity. But that is not what gives people joy at times. People want to feel uh, as intrinsically rewarded, can you see? that? I am doing this because I enjoy doing this. Can you see? And that is the highest level of fulfillment, self actualization, a mass loss theory of motivation. Can you see? 
when people enjoy what they do est intrinsically can you see from the inside instead of from the outward reward is that clear yes sir. yes sir. is that clear are we communicating yes sir fantastic all right so the effect another aspect is that the effect of span of control on employee performance is contingent upon individual dis differences and ability task structure and other organizational factors can you see the effect of span of control the number of people within the control on employee performance is contingent upon individual differences that is to say most of these uh, 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 structures also depend on individual differences there are individuals that would prefer to be controlled there are individuals that may want independence can you see some individuals believe that if they are controlled they don't make mistake but there are individuals that are very innovative they want to experiment they want to initiate they want to take decision related to their work can you see so most of these structures most of these arguments are contingent on individual differences can you see tasks structure and other organizational variables or factors all right the research finding also uh, uh, revealed that participative decision making in decentralized organization is positively related to job satisfaction can you see participation or workers participation from employment relation point of view makes members makes employee or workers to feel that they are parts part and parcel of the decision making of the organization so they invest themselves they commit themselves to the decision that they participated in making can you see so that gives them a kind of satisfaction that this decision was not imposed on us but we were consulted, we participated, we presented our position as far as this decision is concerned. So that gives them joy and a kind of satisfaction. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fantastic. All right. Yeah. We progress. So organizational structure, it determinant and outcomes. Can you see? Organization it determinants and outcome. You can see causes of what are the things that inform structure, or what are the things that affect culture, or what are the things that leads to a particular structure. Sorry, not culture that leads to a particular structure. The first one there is strategy, like I have mentioned to you, the different strategies. The second one there is the size of an organization. The third one there is the technology in which to transfer input into output. And of course, the fourth one there is environment. And all these things determines the structural design of an organization, whether it is mechanistic or organic. Can you see? Whether it is mechanistic or organic structure. And of course, that leads to performance and of course, satisfaction. But of course, this performance and satisfaction is moderated by individual differences and, of course, uh, cultural norms. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's the structure there. Thanks a lot. So, implicit model of organizational structure perception that people hold regarding structural variable is formed by observing things around them in an unscientific fashion. It's just a random of implicit of organizational structure. All right. So with that, we'll come to an end in terms of organizational structure. Let's go back to your original slide now, uh, uh, the one I sent to you. 
uh, from uh, uh, Professor De Thomas, uh, so that we can uh, relate to organizational culture. Can you see? Uh, I think that has a, okay, we still have time. We, we, we yeah. may even touch on this. Are you gonna share Hello? this slide, this? Are you gonna share this slide with us, this organizational structure slide? Yeah, I have already shared it. Have you not received it? No, Are you no. not checking your document? I have already sent this to you as far back as our last class. Okay, I'll check again. Yeah, in fact, I sent two documents to you on this structure because I have the two, I have the two slides. Uh, this slide that I have sent to you is that of uh, 2005. So recently, of course, uh, uh, the the producer Spencer was able to send me the latest of the slide, but when I look at both of them, the 2005 seems to be more original from my point of view because it gives pictures and examples that can help you, the students, to understand. So there's no different, much different about uh, the the content of the slides, but I think I prefer the older one uh, because uh, it seems uh, ancient and modern and. Uh, can actually relate the topic of where to you uh, in such a way that you grapple. So I have shared both of them. If you are comfortable with the recent one, you are free to use the recent one. If you are comfortable with the old one, you are free to use the old one. Is that clear? Yes, I know. This one is perfect. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. So I have shared the two slides uh, on the same uh, organizational structure. All right. Fantastic. Let's uh, let's uh, move to another uh, another one there. Uh, uh, stop sharing this. Uh, okay. Let's uh, take another another share. All right. Uh, okay, so systematically we are entering into the Edu <laughs> Edu League, you know. <laughs> I, I think initially I was uh, enjoying uh, the Zoom meetings because I always use that for Stana related meetings. But you can see now how we can change all of a sudden. So that is also part of what we are uh, doing, you know, uh, uh, trying to be flexible as much as we can. You know, you cannot stick to one thing. Can you see? This is part of now multi-skilling and uh, learning so fast, you know, because immediately you now, the customers demanded something else. I have to go for a workshop immediately to see, <laughs> to see how to accommodate your request. Can you see? Yeah. You with me? Aha. Uh -huh. I have to see how to make sure that I meet your request by going out extra miles to uh, get acquainted with the, with, uh, uh, the EduLink uh, uh, way of presentation, or the Blackboard, I mean, uh, way of pr presentation. All right. That's like I told you also, you, you the students, are our customers. So customer satisfaction is paramount now in the modern days. Can you see that you are satisfied in terms of your uh, knowledge, in terms of, of course, uh, 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 your, your school fees and other things, you know. So that is why uh, any uh, reasonable lecturer have to also see how to accommodate uh, 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 some of your requests also, you know. All right. Okay. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, corporate culture. Although if we have time, we'll dip deep also into some of the slides. Or I will forward the slide of the culture uh, from Robin and George, uh, of course, uh, Robin and uh, uh, George and Odenda and Rich to you so that you do your own uh, self-reading 
in terms of the culture using the slide that I will, uh, I will uh, paste for you or I will upload uh, for you. Is that clear? Is that clear? Hello? Is that yes, clear? Yes, sir. Okay, cool, cool, fantastic. All right, now with regards to uh, uh, corporate culture, uh, just keep it in mind, uh, just keep it in mind that of course, uh, 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 just a minute, I just wanted to touch on one thing. Uh -huh. If you look at uh, determinant of structure, like of course uh, in uh, Professor De Thomas' uh, 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 document, he said, what are the implications of innovative strategy? And she gave an example, innovative strategy, Google. That is why I told you IT companies, you know, uh, 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 most of the uh, new IT uh, companies, uh, or information technology company. They are innovative. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, bringing up new products uh, that uh, uh, we can use. And of course, before you settle in for that product, another one is art. Uh, and of course, uh, in terms of cost minimization strategy, which is of course a mechanistic structure. And of course, she also gave example of a construction company, can you see, which is building complain. And of course, uh, an imitation strategy, combination of mechanistic and organic. And she spoke about fashion houses like Edgar's, Woolworth, and all the rest. All right. Great, 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 great. All right. And when we talk about technology uh, in terms of uh, delivery system, you can see now currently electronic banking will change the structure of banks. You know, will change the structure of banks. Banks will no longer have hierarchical structure. I think banks are articulated organic, uh, of course, a flat uh, structure. All right. Great. Okay, we'll progress. I just wanted to reflect on uh, the slide uh, to give you more perspective of what we have been discussing. Now we'll come to corporate culture. Corporate culture. What can, co what are, what can culture do for an organization? Just like every society, just like every community, or just like every group have their culture. Like we talk about Zulu culture, we talk about Corsa culture, we talk about vendor culture. That is how organizations, our corporations, have their culture, the way they do things, the way they behave, their value system, what they hold strong in terms of their perception, how they do things, can you see? So the same way every group or grouping within a country or a society have their respective culture, that is why, that is how every organization have their own culture. So culture can have significant effect on organization long-term performance or complete long-term performance. Culture is a critical factor in determining the sources of failure of an organization. It's a critical factor in determining the sources of failure of an organization. So, of course, culture can inhibit strong long-term financial performance. Culture can inhibit strong long-term financial performance. Can you see? And it's not real, can you see? It, and it's not rare, sorry. And of course, although tough to change, can be made more performance enhancing, but that requires also leadership, can you see? You see, once culture is established, it is sometimes difficult to change, can you see? And of course, if you don't change your culture, so the dynamism of the environment, definitely, certainly culture can kill an organization. You see? So it takes a leader to understand that their culture is an impediment to progress and initiate changes. Can you see? So leadership has a role to play in terms of uh, changing 
the culture to make it more performance enhancing. Is that clear? Starting points. In order, of course, to of course uh, uh, keep the culture of an organization alive, there is need to retain good staff in the interest of the company. I see. There is a need to retain good staff or good employees in the interest of the company. Employees that can actually acclimatize with the company's culture. I see. If you recruit those who are not in tune with your culture, certainly either there will be a very uh, 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 continuous uh, attrition or employee turnover in your organization. And turnover has negative effect to the organization's bottom line or the organization's profitability. I see it is a cost to an organization. Rapid turnover or rapid attrition is a huge cost to organization. So organizational context can promote the culture, the culture of an organization or the context of an organization can promote or inhibit the full productivity of different people within that organization, the diverse employee within a, a particular organization. Now we spoke about employee turnover or attrition level within an organization. Just some facts uh, 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 that is actually reflected in this slide is one, hidden expenses account for 80% or more of turnover cost. I told you rapid turnover is a cost to an organization. Now another uh, uh, point there is that during a vacancy, 50% of the efficiency of the position is lost. Can you see? During a vacancy, 50% of the efficiency of the position, because the person has acquired knowledge in that position, has become an expert in that position, and he leaves. Definitely 50% of the efficiency of that position is lost. These are statistics coming out from parts, research. And of course, another aspect that is Turnover cost is, is estimated at 1.5 times annual salary. The cost of turnover is estimated at 1.5 times annual salary of workers or the worker that, that uh, uh, has left the organization. Now, departed employees, in terms of departed employees, these are points you need to keep in mind. Efficiency decline begin three months prior to departure. I said for departing employees. Now, about one month of productivity is lost during three months. Three months. Ten percent of supervisor's time is lost. I see. As a result of departing employees, eight percent of time of other employee is lost. I see. Because most of the employees will carry the load of also the other uh, employee that is leaving. Then in terms of hiring new employee, 12.5 months for new executive to feel comfortable in job. It takes 12.5 months, almost a year and a few months for new executive to feel comfortable in, in the job. Then 13.5 months for new employees to achieve maximum efficiency within an organization. 13.5 months. 14% of supervisor's time and 8 to 12% of co workers' time spent on assisting new employees. Is spent on assisting new employees. You see? That is why we must watch it out. Uh, 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 with regards to employee turnover, as managers, as leaders, we must try our possible best to reduce turnover, attrition within our, uh, our organization because it, it, it's a cost bearing activity. Can you see? It, it, it brings a lot of cost to an organization. 
All right. Now we're still talking about organizational culture. Organizational culture can be can also be taught, according to uh, Cher and Martin, organizational culture can be taught of as the glue that holds an organization together through a sharing of patterns of meaning. The culture focuses on the values, the values, the core value of an organization, the beliefs, what they hold here, what they believe. Can you see? What they believe, an expectation that members come to share. Can you see? An expectation, values, belief, expectation that members come to share. It becomes a shared value, a shared belief, and a shared expectation. That is what organizational culture is. I will progress in terms of definition of organizational culture. Corporate culture, according to schools, corporate culture is the implicit, invisible, intrinsic, and informal consciousness of the organization, which guides the behavior of individual and who shapes itself out of their behavior. Can you see? It is unconscious or something uh, 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 that you are not, it, it, it becomes a part of you. Can you see? Informal consciousness. Can you see? Which is, of course, unconscious, you know, belief invisible that you cannot see but we have this shared belief can you see which guides the behavior of individuals and who shape itself out of their behavior that is according to schools uh schools 1987. then uh, of course uh we'll talk about in terms of robin which is of course your current textbook the definition of organizational culture it's a system of shared meaning, a system of shared meaning, meaning that is shared by more than two people, or less, the majority of people within an organization or members of the organization, by members that distinguishes the organization from other organizations. So this culture distinguishes one organization from another organization. Can you see? The way they do things. Can you, see? you can enter some organization, you can see the way they welcome you as their customer. The politeness, the, 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 the gentleness. Can you see? The way they welcome, that is their culture. That is part of what they share. Respect your customer, treat them with utmost care. It becomes their culture. But there are some organizations you enter, okay, they may be good, but they are not so formal about how you are welcome. That is their culture. Can you see? There are some organizations you can enter, you can see their code of dressing. They dress in a gentle way. I was giving some of my students, for instance, the banking sector in Nigeria and the banking sector in South Africa. You can enter the banking sector in South Africa, you can see people with just simple dressing, jean, and a t-shirt operating in the bank. But in the banking sector in Nigeria, people prefer to wear a suit, to look very gentle, and to look very cordial, can you see? So both of them are good, can you see? That is the culture of the different banks, you know, in Nigeria, and of course, uh, the banks in South Africa, can you see? So that is their culture. That would be way the uh, South Africa they believe in simplicity. That my dressing doesn't stop me from doing my banking job. And of course, in Nigeria they believe, okay, my attire makes me to look more gentle to my to my customers. Can you see? So a system of shared meaning held by members to distinguish the organization from other organizations. Is that clear? Yes, yes, exactly. yes sir. Right, that is organizational culture for you. All right. So, according to uh, Hofstad, Hofstad is trying to actually tell us how uh, uh, this culture is uh, reflected or this culture is practiced. Can you see? 
how we practice this culture. It's a, uh, we practice culture or we reflect this culture through symbols. Can you see? Symbols. What are the symbols of our culture? For instance, if you are traveling to any part of the world, when you see McDonald's, you, see, you know this is McDonald's. That is symbol, the big M. When I went to Spain, I saw McDonald's. It is also the same big M like the one I, <laughs> I only see in South Africa. That is their symbol. Can you see? They show symbols. Can you see? And there are the structure also of the organization. McDonald's in every part of South Africa, the structure look almost similar. Can you see? So those are the symbols, you know. And that is how you practice your culture. And of course, when you see a KFC, you know, this is the KFC. Can you see? The way the structure, even in terms of the structure of the organization, is almost similar. And you will know it is KFC. Those are symbols. And there are different symbols that reflect particular organization. And of course, another way of practicing culture is, of course, reflected through the heroes. The heroes are the people who put and perpetuate the culture of an organization. They try to make other people to exhibit the culture of the organization. Can you see? They can actually live and die for the culture of the organization. Although they are not the main originator of the culture, but they are those who practice and show love for the culture of the organization. So those are regarded as uh, the heroes, can you see? And of course, the rituals, how we do things within the organization, can you see? Our process, our procedures of doing things, those are the rituals and those are ways we reflect and practice uh, our culture. And of course, the values, the beliefs, the value system within the organization, can you see? Value system. Honesty is a value system. Respect is a way of life. It's we believe in respecting people. Can you see? So the value system of an organization is also one way of reflecting the culture of an organization. All right. Then uh, organization culture is the way of life in an organization. Can you see? In a simple term. It's just the way of life in an organization, all right? So how do we develop culture? How do we continue to reinforce our culture? For us to reinforce our culture, for us to maintain our culture, for us to enhance our culture, it must be led by top management, can you see? Top management must show the way, can you see? A top manager cannot say you must be ethical in your practice, whereas he himself is not ethical. Can you see? It must be led by top management. Can you see? Then the last one is how do you develop culture? Teach the culture. Teach the culture or teaching of the culture, which is through mentoring. Can you see? When we have new employees within the organization or senior employees mentoring younger employees about how things are done in the organization, how you treat people, how you manufacture, and the procedures of things in the organization, the process, that is mentoring process, can you see? So teach the culture or teaching of the culture. Then another aspect in terms of in terms of uh, developing the culture or perpetrating the culture, is reminding members through stories and legends. Can you see? Continue to tell them stories. Stories. Beautiful stories of how this culture have endured and how this culture have carried this organization from one state to the other. Can you see? Tell them success stories of the organization. Can you see? Tell them leaders that have actually promoted this culture. Tell them how this culture have endured over the years. That is reminding members true stories or legends. Can you see? 
Yeah, another aspect in terms of developing culture is complicating culture through rituals and ceremonies. Can you see? Through rituals, through our ways of doing things, through our procedures of doing things, through our manners of doing things, and of course, through the ceremonies we do within the organization, we communicate our culture to members of the organization. That is one way of developing a culture or improving our culture or enhancing or, of course, perpetuating our culture. Then the next one is ensuring behavior exemplifies the culture by recognizing those who adhere to and perpetuate the culture. That is the heroes. Ensuring behavior, ensuring behavior exemplify the culture by recognizing, recognize those who are the heroes, who are the perpetrators of the culture, perpetrators of the culture. Can you see? Perpetuate the culture. Those are the heroes. Reward them. Recognize them. In the presence of other staff members, that these are the people who recognize, who are promoting our culture and are caring to the tenets of our culture. Can you see? So recognize them and appreciate them in the presence of other staff members. Can you see? And of course, another way of developing and, or reinforcing the culture of an organization is rewarding those who are promoting the culture and penalize behaviors of those who are trying to hinder the promotion of the culture. That is rewarding and penalizing behaviors relating to conformance or non-conformance. Can you see? So these are ways of, of course, uh, 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 reinforcing or developing our culture. Is that clear? Or perpetuating our culture. All right. Creating ethical organization. Creating ethical organization. How do we create an ethical organizational culture? That is where leadership comes again. Creating ethical organizational culture. The first one is visible role modeling. Visible role modeling. Can you see? So visible role modeling, the leaders must show the way. Can you see? Leaders must show the way because they are the role models within the organization. Employees look up to them. Other members of the organization look up to them. So if you tell colleagues that we must not actually uh, 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 commit, for instance, uh, sexual harassment in this organization, and you as a leader, you are found wanting for committing sexual harassment in the organization, then you are not a good role model. Can you see? So there must be visible, visible role modeling. So what the organization forbids, you must not be the one caught in the act as a leader within the organization. You must be a role model. The second one in terms of creating ethical organization culture is Communication of ethical expectation. You have to communicate it to the members of the organization what is expected from them from ethical point of view. And you see, you have to communicate this is what we expect in this organization. And you see, this is what we expect, our expectation. And you see, we expect higher level of doing this. And you see. I remember once upon a time in our department, uh, industrial psychology and people management, where our expectation is be the best. Can you see? That's why we expect everybody. So initially, our what uh, Professor Theo Vetsman used to have was uh, simply the best. <laughs> so one of our strategic uh, meeting, I think uh, Professor Leon Van Borum, who is, uh, I, I mentioned him to you, we're using one of his textbooks on ethics. I think he told uh, Professor Theo Wetzman that uh, simply the best is not very good. <laughs> that is just simple, you know. He said we must take, be the best <laughs> instead of sim 
simply the best. So <laughs> it's just a, a kind of a different perspective. And right from that moment, we have uh, adopted uh, be the best as our organizational expectation. Can you see? Then, of course, the next one there is, uh, uh, yeah, I can see <laughs> Simbi smiling. All right. So the next one there is a visible reward. Visible, visibly reward ethical acts and punish unethical ones. Can you see? Visibly reward ethical acts and punish unethical ones. So for reward those who are showing ethical acts in the organization. And of course, there is punishment for those who exhibit unethical behaviors. Definitely will be reinforcing ethical behaviors. And of course, a kind of destroying or stopping unethical behaviors. Because if there is no punishment for unethical behavior, definitely we will be reinforcing it. But if there is punishment, if there is discipline, if there is warning for unethical behavior, Definitely, the person may not repeat uh, such an ethical behavior, unethical behavior. Is that clear? So the next one is, in terms of creating ethical organizational culture, is provide a safe environment to discuss ethical dilemmas. And you see, there should be a need to provide a safe environment to discuss ethical dilemma. And now, when we talk about issues of ethical dilemma, now we talk now. I have been talking about profit. And of course, destruction of job, where employees are retrenched every day. Can you see? As a result of the interest to make for that profit. So there should be a need to provide a safe environment to discuss such kind of ethical dilemmas. Because for one thing, managers are made to make profit. But also for another thing, job is destroyed and people are laid off. And these people were formerly members of the organization that you called your employees. They are like your brothers in the workplace, because in the workplace, we talk about brotherhood in the workplace. That the relationship between manager and employee should not be that of boss, or should not be that of master and servant, but there should be what we call brotherhood in the workplace. Now, a manager or a leader should be able to balance these ethical dilemmas in terms of decision making can you see provide a safe environment to dis to discuss a ethical dilemma so there are instances where organizations may also uh, 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 be making the profit as well as also destroying job all in the name of cost reduction so these are ways, of course, uh, we can talk about uh, ethical organization culture, promoting a kind of uh, ethical organization uh, culture. All right. Any question? Any no, question? Not from my side. Fantastic. I'm fully understanding. Fantastic. All right. All right, so we we'll come to the end of uh, this slide, chapter one, and uh, I think uh, I will give you now an assignment uh, uh, that is to read the whole of chapter, read the whole of, uh, uh, I'm just coming, organizational structure. Yeah, read the whole of chapter 17 of your textbook by Robin and George the whole chapter 17. That will give you more perspective, deeper knowledge, and deeper uh, understanding of uh, organizational culture. Just read that uh, before uh, our next meeting again, uh, because uh, with that, we have covered the uh, unit one of your learner guide. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So I'm going to have an exam, like I'm going to write something. It could be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, you, you will write an exam, definitely. I will, that, that is why I want to cover some aspect before I give you now the continuous assessment exam, you know, which you have to now also respond to most of this discussion that we're having in the class.
So I don't want to release that question yet. I want just to cover a little bit, then I will release questions uh, related to that, which you have to do on your own and submit as an assignment. Because like I told you, we're not going to do a formal sitting exam because of the COVID-19. Okay, now, sir, I love your style of teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. So, colleagues, in every discussion, sometimes we end up where we started. And where we started was when I told you that the seven factors critical for effective strategic execution, according to McKenzie uh, model, is structure, system, style, staff, skills, strategy, and of course, the goals of an organization. So with this, I come to the end of the class tonight. Have a good night. Thank you. Not, uh, Thank, you. Oh. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Professor, when are you going to upload the slides? Thank I have you, already sir. uploaded it. Check your, oh. check your document. I oh, I to both this slide and of course uh, the two on organizational structure for you. Please don't forget to read the chapter of organizational culture because I'm not going to touch it again. Is that clear? Please. Yeah, you know. Thank you. Well, okay, I'm not going to go there. I'm going back to your unit two. I will meet again. Sir, so just one question on my side. Are we in regard to assignments that we can? Can I use the South African, uh, the leadership of our president as my organization? Can you use what? Uh, the, now I'm asking in regards of the assignment that we have that is shown the 3rd of, of, of May. I want to yeah. use for leadership. Can I use the, the president's uh, leadership style in terms of, of my course, organization? Of course, of course, of course. But of course. It should be reflecting issues related to ethics or ethical issues, you know, uh, 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 basically also, you know. Try and see possibility of also uh, bringing up leadership and ethic related issues, if you can. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that uh, we, 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 because our, our, our discussion is, of course, uh, organizational leadership, and it has a lot of... Uh, ethical implication around it also. So well, it depends on, of course, uh, uh, the research you are doing. Uh, not all of them will actually comprise of ethics, you know, but of course, if you can uh, see how to relate both of them, it can add value to your assignment. Okay, no problem, sir. Thank you so much. Bro. Thank you very much. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very good night rest. Keep on.